Well, here we are live at the Obama Foundation Summit in Chicago. Welcome to the first inaugural Obama Foundation Summit. I will be your host, Hannah Hart. You may know me from my various exploits on the internet or my television show on Food Network called I Heart Food. But today isn't about me, sadly, it's about us. And by us, I mean all of us, which is what the Obama Foundation's mission is all about. It's about community and engagement and empowering those to change positive, to affect positive change in their world. Today we're going to be joined by 500 different civic leaders as they work into breakout sessions and really, I guess, kind of motivate and inspire each other during these interesting times that we live in. Hopefully that uh, is what you guys think. Today and tomorrow, they're going to be exchanging uh, ideas, exploring creative solutions, and working together to experience uh, an increase in civic art and technology. But there's no one here that can better discuss the Obama Foundation than their CEO himself, David Seamus, who's right next to me. I was going to prattle on about your organization, but it also seems like you're the man who should really be here to talk about it. Hannah, first of all, thank you so much <laughs> for taking the time to do this. I can't think of a better way for you to engage as a citizen to bring the skills that you have to try to make your community a little bit better. Uh, this is our beginning. Uh, and the best way to think about it is back in January, the president was here in Chicago and he gave his farewell address. And he said that he was asking people to believe not in his ability to bring about change, but in theirs. And that goes to the heart of who we are, mm. not waiting for change to happen from others. Yeah. But if you see a problem, if you see something that you want to change, you have a responsibility as a citizen, a member of a community, to lift up and do it. I absolutely believe that myself wholeheartedly. David, there is one question uh, that I know is on the tops of minds of everybody here today. Why Halloween? <laughs> uh, so Chicago and Halloween uh, is, is a there a real reason? Well, no, I'm just making oh, okay, that up, good. actually. <laughs> you know, we were going to have a booth with candy, but... Yeah. Uh, no tricks, not, only not, treats here today. exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, David, for you, what really would you like to see the 500 participants here today take away from this experience? I want to see them inspire each other. I want to see them connect with one another. And then I want to see them learn from one another. Mm -hmm. So the president went to Chicago multiple times, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Berlin, Germany, in front of 75,000 young people at the Brandenburg Gate, Jakarta. And he asked each one of those groups what they did that worked and what they did that didn't work. And what we've done over the course of the past nine months is essentially built a list invited people, and the 500 people you see here are either rising citizen stars or established change makers. And so the experience that they're gonna have with one another, uh, my favorite example is Paul Green from Eastern Kentucky, mm -hmm. who's developed a STEM science and technology protocol for kids in the public schools there, sitting down with Sheldon Smith from the south side of Chicago who's been dealing with issues on the South Side and what they can teach each other, yeah. what they can learn from each other, and then for us as a foundation, that's completely predicated on this. Our programming for the course of the next year is gonna be informed by the conversations we hear today. I, I honestly believe that people give so much credit to words, but not enough credit to actions. And it seems like every person that you guys have invited here today is someone who has proven that their words align with their actions and they're using their actions to motivate positive change. Right. And what better environment for them to learn than from each other? That's exactly right. You know, I, I, I also, you know, you mentioned public schools and they hold a special place in my heart because I really do believe that we need to start um, with education right. first and foremost and protect education as a sacred right. And it makes me happy to hear about people getting involved in their own communities as opposed to just and I think we're all you know we're all victim to doing this sometimes but just talking about how things would be different talking about how things could be better but not actually activating on Anna, it. this is at the heart of our theory of change when someone works in their community around food deserts or around not having enough access to public health services. Those discussions among neighbors aren't Democratic or Republican. They're not left or right. They are people who are neighbors, who are citizens in a community who are saying, what can I, what can we do to make something better? Yeah. And the beauty of that is that we don't have to focus on the things that tear us apart. 
we can focus like a laser beam on those things that are common, our personal stories, and what's possible rather than what's impossible. In the next 48 hours, with some of the people we're about to see, you can't help but be inspired by that. I, I think a lot of us are here for that today. I think we're ready for that. I can't see the comments, but can I get an amen? Uh, all right, whatever you believe in. Um, so I think that we're actually about ready to start with our first Great. guest. I got the little signal, though, David, truly, I feel like I could talk to you all day. I have so many things I want to say, especially because I think positive change in your community is at its heart a bipartisan issue. That's exactly it doesn't, it, it, it just is about making your community better in any way that you can. But speaking of making your community better in any way that you can, I would like to introduce Greg Mooney, who is here from the Comer Science and Education Foundation. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Greg, let's talk a little bit about you and what you do. How did you get started? Can you give us a brief summary of your work and how you got started in it? Sure, uh, I've been working with the Comer Education Campus for the last 15 years. We're on Chicago's South Side and we focus on uh, holistic education, enrichment, and college success uh, for young people who most often end up being the first in their families to go on to college. Wow. Yeah. The first members of their families to go to college? To go on to college, yes. Oh, wow. That is wonderful. Yeah. Showing it not only to themselves, but to everyone in their own community that going off to a place like college is possible. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, Hannah, uh, Gary and the Obama Foundation had an opportunity to partner on our first Obama Foundation event. Gary, um, beyond the training, give me a sense of what the kids were saying after the session was over and why that was meaningful sure. and impactful to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. one of the most special parts uh, was seeing them come in at 8 a.m. in the morning and then seeing them leave at 8 p.m. in the evening. And, and what, you know, some, some sleepy-eyed, uh, you know, 18 to 24-year-olds were sort of uh, ushering into breakfast and then the just the, the, the sheer physical uh, confidence and energy that you saw them leaving at the end of the day. These are 150 young people who, who didn't really know each other prior to this day. And they dove into uh, significant community issues. They grappled with those issues. They came up with solutions. And then they left, you know, realizing that, hey, we can do this if we do it together. My favorite thing was when one young man said, I can do anything which is kind of the point of the work that you do. Yeah. Can I ask you, Greg, how do you empower individuals who maybe have felt like they don't have a voice to be active and engaged during those sessions? Sure. So, so well, at Comer, we really focus on meeting young people where they're at and giving them a whole host of opportunities to engage. Sometimes it's through programs in the art room or sports or through our urban agriculture initiative. And if young people can start to feel success in an area that they have a particular interest in, it buoys them into figuring out ways that they can have an impact and be successful in their communities. Not, not every young person is ready to just hit the streets right away, right? But uh, finding those opportunities where they can engage based on their passions and interests. I think that confidence is one of the greatest resources a young person can have, confidence in their own thoughts or dreams and ambitions, and, and taking that kind of that seed of self-worth and expanding it outside of yourself so that you can create more worth for everyone in your community. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, no. Gary, so the work you do is uh, rewarding and hard at the same time. Correct, um, absolutely. Why do you do the work that you do? What is it the spark? that for you said, you know what, Greg, I'm Greg Mooney, I'm gonna do this. What is it that brought you to this? You know, uh, 15 years ago, I was invited by Gary Comer to uh, kind of join a vision that he was forming. He grew up in the community that we work in in the 1930s. And, you know, years later, you know, well after a long, successful professional career, he decided to dig in uh, to, to, to the neighborhood that was his childhood home. and. Uh, you know, he, he invited me to be part of that uh, a long time ago, and, and it was a special invitation at that point, and that always resonates uh, just about every day in the work that we do. I mean, we, we tell young people, uh, our, one of our mantras is redefine possible. You can redefine possible. You are redefining possible. And, and I would say the, 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 the training day and, and this summit puts that mantra on really, really an international scale. This is, this is no longer just about your community on the south side of Chicago. This is about so much more. 
It's powerful. Yeah, I love that quote. What is it? It says, uh, "Anything's everything's impossible until proven possible." Yeah. You know, and I think that that is something that we don't. You know, we don't teach our, our young people early enough in their life that this is something that you can do and you can make. You don't have to just live in the environment you've always lived in. You can expand outside of it. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And it comes through incremental steps, you know, building blocks, really. And, and so that, that training day was, uh, you know, a, a really pivotal building block. Wonderful. Uh, and lastly, right before you go, what are you most excited to get out of this summit? You know, uh, I'm... I got a, a few things. I mean, I'm excited to learn. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward and expecting to be inspired. And I think there's also clearly a message that as a community, we're going to come together and, and, and enjoy each other, meet some people, and have fun. That's wonderful. Great, thank so, you. Absolutely. Great, thank you so Thanks much for, for joining us. Great. Happy summit. All right, absolutely. You know? <laughs> Happy Halloween. Awesome. Wow, what a great guy. So awesome. You know, every, I feel like every guest we have here, I want to go after this is done and Google them and really dive in and see what their work is all about. And he gets up every day and does impactful work in a community that too often people gets focus ignored. on the negative, yeah. but he finds that positive and lifts it up in an inspiring way. That's Love amazing. That That's amazing. Okay, further inspiration includes our next guest, Elaine McMillian Sheldon, who is a documentary filmmaker. Elaine, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, can you tell us a little bit um, about the type of films you make and uh, your documentary, Heroin? Yeah, so the film we're showing here is a 39 minute film called Heroin. It's about three women on the front lines of the opioid crisis in Huntington, West Virginia. A fire chief, a drug court judge, and a street missionary as they go out and try to help men and women that are suffering from substance use disorder. What inspired you to start working in, and I guess, the area of opioid abuse specifically? I'm from West Virginia. I grew up there. As if that's yeah. the only thing you need it's to like say. Right down the street. Unfortunately, it's part of the childhood experience to know that there's a pill mill down the street. When those got shut down, it quickly turned to heroin, and now it's fentanyl and carfentanyl, which is killing people like crazy. So it's it's no longer just simply opioids in, in the traditional sense that we think of them. Um, so yeah, it got to the point where obituaries and mugshots of friends were enough that it was I just wanted to explore something maybe more hopeful through the lens of these three women and when you think about the individual stories that you saw and that you put into your documentary as well as the stories that weren't put in what's the thing that makes you the most hopeful based upon what you heard people talk about and say Oh, I think that recovery is possible. You know, there are many of my own friends who are in long-term recovery. Um, you just have to have resources, you know, and unfortunately right now in this country, it's very difficult to get access to uh, recovery in all shapes and forms, whether it's 30-day programs or six-month programs. Uh, women who have children can't take their uh, kids to programs. So, you know, how do you get help if your resources are so limited? The hopeful side of that is there are people working to change that. You know, Jan Rader, first responder, she revives five to six people every single day from a drug overdose. Every day. Every day. Um, and she's here right now, and she's an incredible, and she gives me hope, because in some, somehow, it's like beyond humanity to me, these women stay positive through this experience and continue to get up every morning and help their community, so. Mm. Wow. Powerful. It's so, it's so sad to think that the access to the drugs is so much easier than the access and to the resource to recover from those drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Around what, what age did you see people first start to experiment? Well, I think Jan said last year the youngest overdose was 12 and the oldest was 78. 12 years old? Yeah. See, so that, that is devastating because it's like how, how much hopelessness could a 12-year-old possibly feel that would drive them to, to want to turn to drugs? Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, some, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty high percentage of heroin users that actually start with a prescription mm -hmm. opioid, so Oxycontin and, and drugs that are prescribed by a doctor. So it's not always straight to heroin. And some people, you know, when they, when they uh, build up a tolerance from pills and their doctor stops prescribing them, um, they get sick. It's, it's dope sickness. It's the flu times 10. It's bones aching. It's, it's a terrible sickness. And we don't have, there's eight detox beds in Cabell County. And wow. that's where these women work. And it's nearly 100,000 people. Um, there's just not enough resources. I really believe in 2017 that there's got to be a better future for pain management than just having everyone start taking the same narcotics. So true. When I think about all the people that are here today from all around the world, and how each one of them have used this skill to try to make their community a little bit better. You're a storyteller. Uh, when you think about the power of story 
and what you're trying to do. Talk to me a little bit about that passion that you have and how that fits into positive change, not only in West Virginia, but in the country and the world. Well, I think we've seen that we're divided. You know, we've, we're, t we're being told we're divided. And so I'm just trying to tell stories that can potentially connect us, that connect us to the bigger themes that we all have in common. Like, yes, it's about addiction and you may self, you may not have addiction in your family or in, in your life, but you can connect to the Jan Raider of the world that gets up every day. And it's, I, it's just about humanity. Like storytelling is is about making connections between people that are from seemingly different opposite ends of the of the world, even in America. So, sure. uh, what do you hope to get out of the summit here today? Is it that same feeling of making connections with others? Or I hope to meet the Obamas. <laughs> <gasps> oh man, I think everybody here hopes. Uh, to, we all no, have the same I'm just, hope. I'm just really honored. We're all honored to be here. We're excited. We hope people will come to the breakout session, give us more ideas about how we can help all communities, not just through this crisis, but others, and we're just happy to be here. Great. If you could leave with one message uh, for those at home watching, what would you want them to hear? Um, if you want to learn more about the opioid crisis, watch our film on Netflix. It's called Heroin. Wonderful. Elaine, thank you. Be sure to check it out. Thank you so much, Elaine. Wow. Well, it's I, amazing. it's amazing. It's also heartbreaking, uh, but I think that's a lot of how this summit is going to be. It's going to be very amazing, inspiring, and also a, a, a cold and shock of reality. And you see the resiliency, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, our next guest, I, for one, am incredibly excited to introduce. Fanboy, fangirl I moment. I know, fanboy, fangirl Come right on. here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Andy Puticombe, the founder of Headspace. Hi, Hello, no, Andy. Hi, Andy. How are you? I Lovely use your here. app every day. Do you really? I really do. Well, thank you for using it. This is a huge moment for me. No. Oh. <laughs> oh, she was saying the whole time, she completely ignored me for the first five minutes and said, do you know that's Andy? I said, excuse me, <laughs> sir. That's not true. Right. That's <laughs> not true. No, but Andy, uh, for those who, who might not yet know about the wonder that is Headspace, which is frankly, honestly, I think my favorite app, um, would you give us a please uh, summary of what you do? Sure, so um, look, it's important to say, kind of Headspace grew out of, it wasn't designed to be an app originally. I was just a, a Buddhist monk who stopped being a Buddhist monk and I kind of wanted to make meditation more accessible. And it's important to say I'm a co-founder as well. Uh -huh. So Rich is, is the co-founder. And, and I met Rich and he was like, this is amazing. We should make this for everybody. Let's put it on an app. And I'm like, that's never going to work. That is never going to work. So we started doing events. And then over time, it kind of it grew to become what is now the Headspace app. And it's, it's essentially meditation and mindfulness made simple, you know, just served up in a digital way on your phone so you can use it wherever, wherever you are. I have honestly introduced Headspace to the most, um, I guess, you know, uh, hesitant to try meditation. And I think that the way that you present it is in a, a very approachable, non-secular format, just to invite people yeah. into giving themselves a little bit of Headspace. I think the, the truth is that all of us, no matter what we do, where we come from, like we all need that time in the day just to pause and to kind of reconnect with that place of calm and clarity that I think is very easily lost in a very, a very noisy world right now. Right. And know. in that moment of reconnecting with your own um, sense of self and who you yeah. are, talk about the connection between that moment and then community writ large. Yeah. How does that help bring others in? So that's the bit that I'm, I'm most excited about, I'm most passionate about, and something I'm looking forward to speaking about tomorrow, tomorrow morning. You know, it's really interesting when you come together, groups of people as well. So there's obviously meditating, meditating on our own and how we then take that into the world. But when we come together as well, and when we put down our thoughts, when we put down our storylines, there's no division, there's no conflict, and we're united in silence. And I think it doesn't matter whether we're doing it together as a group, like we will be tomorrow, or this afternoon, you know, or, or any other time when we, when we meditate on our own we then take that quality into the world and it's an opportunity to create space in the mind where we can listen to others where we can better share with others where we can better learn from others and and really kind of contribute to community in a way that i think is very difficult to when we're caught up in our in our own thinking it's true. I, I love the analogy um, of the clear blue sky, and I encourage everyone watching, if you, if you don't have any idea what meditation is like, watch the video that explains what the clear blue sky um, that Headspace has made. I don't know what it's exactly called. But I, really at the heart of it is the more, the more space you create, almost like the more space you create between yourselves, the more you have to give and to participate in this world. And yeah. it's not necessarily as transactional as giving. It's just... Yeah. 
that you are bigger than just your own stress? I, I think that's it. We tend, to, we tend to box ourselves in and to think of ourselves in a, a certain way. We attach labels to ourselves and we then, fall, we, so we then go on and live that way. I think the more we meditate, the more we realize there's, there's a huge amount of space that our potential is limitless and together, like that's huge. We can do something really special in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Are you getting lulled into a meditative state just hearing his voice? <laughs> He's the narrator on the app. Uh, Andy, I could literally spend all day talking to you, but I am being told we have to move on to our next right. exciting guest. Before you go, if there's one message you'd like to leave with those watching, what would it be? To look after your mind, whether it's for yourself, or whether it's for the people around you, whether it's for your community, take the time to look after your mind. It's Wonderful. the most important thing. Yes, absolutely. Lovely. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Wow. Were you starstruck? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, Hannah, I'm the Come CEO of the Obama Let's Foundation. <laughs> All right. Well, our next guest is going to be Tamata uh, Amaral de Fontes, who is the founder of the, and I'm going to say this in English, Movement Map Education. Can you say it for me? <laughs> it's called in Portuguese, Movimento Map Educação. Wonderful. Tabata, é um grande prazer. Sou português. So I queria falar com você um pouco em, em português uh, para, para as pessoas que vão ver isto in Brazil, in Portugal, in Moçambique, Angola, Guiné-Bissau, Cabo Verde, so, un grand plaisir. Muito, muito plaisir. Sí. It's an amazing opportunity to be here and I'm extremely happy. Great. All I know is, uh, obrigada. That's right, obrigada, thank you. We nailed it. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your organization or how you got started in your work? Yes, so I work with two social movements back in Brazil. One of them, in one of them, we fight for quality education for all because our public schools are in general very poor quality and we mobilize young people so they can become civic activists for quality education. So we do conference trainings and organize campaigns so we can make sure that candidates, voters and at the end government officials know that education is the most important way for Brazil to walk. Amazing. So, yeah. And what, what motivated you to begin this work? Because you began you began this because uh, a while ago. What was yes. the spark? So when I was in seventh grade, because of math Olympiads, I got a scholarship in a private school. And even though the, scholar, the school was only one hour away from my house, I realized how unequal Brazil was. And I realized that in, that inequality started with our school system. And not only was the access to service different in the center and in the periphery where I am from, but also the size of the dreams that people had. So back at home, people were like, they have drug addictions, they were involved with crime, and they would dream sometimes to end high school. Mm -hmm. But when I went to the center, people were dreaming of becoming doctors, astronauts, engineers, and that's absurd. So I got very passionate about education, and I just, I don't know, my mission started there. Yeah, absolutely. What do you hope to get out of your time here at the summit? So, uh, I work with MAP Educação and also a political renovation movement. And in both movements, we have a lot of volunteers. And we have a lot of people back in Brazil that want to, to do things and want to do things, but just don't know how. So I'm really hopeful to make connections and meet people and just get the technology and the tools for us to coordinate all those volunteers and actually start a movement in the entire country. Yeah. This is precisely, this is precisely why we're having this summit. So you and hundreds of others can learn from each other and then go back to your country, your city, and build on the good work you're doing already. That's, what an inspiring story. Absolutely. Thank you, and that's why I'm so happy to be here because it can feel very lonely sometimes, but when you come to events like this, you realize we share a lot of challenges, we share a lot of ideas, and we share a lot of passion. So imagine if we can get together and realize that we are not alone, that it's, this is a global and bigger movement. Yeah, it's like education is the seed, passion is the water, and then possibility is what springs forth. Exactly, and opportunities to change this world. Ah, oh, yes, absolutely. I've got to learn Portuguese. Um, before we, before, it, it's been lovely talking to you. If you had one message to leave with those watching at home, what would it be? So with all the opportunities I've had and all the difficulties I've faced, I really understood and learned that education and politics are the way to transform our societies. And we will do that with more democracy, not less democracy. And I think a lot of societies need to hear that message. Wonderful. Thank Grand you. So. Muito prazer, muito obrigada. Adeus. Muito prazer, obrigada. Tchau, tchau. You know? Tchau.
What were you, were you saying that you, your family is from Brazil? Or you no, no, how my, did you speak Portuguese my, just now? Uh, my family, mom and dad are from Portugal. They immigrated here in 1969, and so I didn't speak English wow. until probably kindergarten. Um, so, um, so it's still, wow. Uh, yeah, and whenever I'm really upset or angry, it just flows in Portuguese <laughs> it just comes right out. away. Oh, wow. Good to know. Yes. All right. Well, we're on to, I think, I believe our final guest here today. Uh, I would love to introduce everyone to Jamal Cole, the founder of my block, my hood, my city. Hannah, thanks for having me. Hannah, thanks for having me. David, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, Jamal. No for those who might not know, uh, can you give us a little brief summary about your organization? Yeah, sure. Um, a lot of teenagers in Chicago have never been downtown. They've never seen the lake. Uh, they never wait for a taxi. They never had a boarding pass. Um, they order their food every day through bulletproof glass windows. Of course, that's tragic. So I take teenagers from these under-resourced communities on educational field trips, and I expose them to different cultures, different professions, and different cuisines. Are you from Chicago? I am a soft side all day. Wow. <laughs> so when I ask you uh, what inspired you to get started in this work, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was a volunteer at Cook County Jail, to be honest with you. And it was the jail where I, I just asked teenagers, I said, hey, have you guys ever been downtown? They said, no. I said, have you ever seen the lake? They said, no. I said, what do you want to be? I want to be a rapper. I want to be a basketball player. And so I said, you know what? I want to start exposing you to different career fields. So hopefully you have more options to choose from when you uh, graduate college. When I was little, I wanted to be a DJ. Oh, yes? And you, so. <laughs> you got great shoes, by the way. So. Thank you. We talked about our, we shared our mutual love of shoe game earlier. Thank yeah. you for pointing them out. No doubt. Um, what, what are you hoping to get out of the summit here today? I mean, it's an unprecedented, unprecedented collaboration of, of thought leaders from, you know, 60 different countries, for God's sakes. I met somebody downstairs that um, is from London that has a, um, a pet robot that's five feet tall. I met an astrophysicist from Brazil. You know, I'm, I'm just, I want to learn what's some simple solutions that people are doing on the block level, and how can I incorporate those solutions in, in my community? And the amazing thing, Jamal, which is not amazing, but those same individuals, or many like them, uh, when they hear your story about how you began your path and how you do your work every day, yeah. are as inspired by your commitment to change as you are by theirs. And my question for you is, the work you do is hard every single day. What is that spark that you have that you can fall back on, that even on the days where you don't want to do it or you have some doubt, you keep at it? You know what? I, I, um, it's God's put a battery in my back. Mm. And, you know, I'm just not willing to, to say no. I'm not willing to give up. And, um, and I'm a reader. You know, I, I, I want to create change. I want to dedicate my life to creating change. And so you can save five years just by reading a book. And so I'm like, wow, this is how they did it back in the 60s with no social media. I have LinkedIn today, I have Twitter today, there's no reason I should fail. So I, I'm really about being practical and then talking to the leaders of my community and asking for advice. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What lessons have you learned from the leaders of those communities? Um, just, you know what, um, one of the main lessons that I learned is that, just it's about your perspective, right? So. It's a sale, it'll be two salesmen, like a salesman will look outside and say, wow, it's raining real bad outside. With weather like this, no way I can go out and make sales. Another salesman will look outside and say, it's raining real bad. What a great day to go out and make sales is everybody's going to be home, especially the salespeople. It's the same thing with community organizing. Some people in Chicago, they look outside and say, wow, you know, the city's messed up, the weather is messed up, the politicians are messed up, and they don't create change. But some people like me, I look outside and say, man, the city is messed up, the weather is messed up, these things, and I still go out and create change. So it's, it's my perspective that um, that's, Absolutely. that's my part. It's about your perspective to see potential instead of problems. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm just all, you know, I got a wife at home and a little six-year-old daughter, so uh, my dad ran for Alderman when I was 11 years old, and so I got to collect flyers with him or collect signatures in front of Jules, pass out flyers. That was very inspirational. Seeing President Obama do his Senate debates on Chicago tonight, that was very inspira inspirational as well. So, so um, we've got this wonderful video on the Obama Foundation website of Jamal doing his work in the community. Yeah. It's one of the videos that we have that just people flock to, not only because of the type of work, but the way you do your work, Thank you. uh, which for me is why Chicago is the appropriate and right place to be the center of this movement for active citizenship. Yeah. And you're just a great example of it. So well, inspired every day, man. Well, thank you guys for coming to this city. Yeah. And we're the epicenter for community organizing you in got the it. world at Chicago. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Before you go, if there's one thing you'd like to say to leave with the viewers at home. You guys got to go buy a hoodie. Go to yeah. formyblock.org, buy a hoodie. Every hoodie helps teenagers go on educational field trips. Get yourself a hoodie. And you also sell hats? Hats. We're going to have some shoes sometime soon. Yeah, you got, got some got nice got shoes like this? Hats. That'd exactly. be perfect. Jamal, exactly. thank you so much for being Thanks here. For
Appreciate you, man. Thanks, you, man. Thank you. Ah, man. Hey, thank you so much. Wow, I am really excited for your weekend ahead. And that's just a handful of the hundreds of people who all have those individual stories that are just the reason why I am hopeful every single day. Wow, that's absolutely wonderful. Well, guys, uh, I would love to spend more time with you, but I believe that there is something you all want to see, which is the beginning of this amazing summit starting momentarily. I'd like to say that throughout the next few days, you can come back to the live desk, which will feature additional interviews from Obama Foundation staff and summit participants. If this is just a sampler platter, I am ready to dive into the main course. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. And now to the main stage.